All right, yeah, I'm giving an overview of the Protocol Guild. My name is Trent Van Epps, and I do ecosystem outreach at the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, but first, I want to give a shout out to Kevin, Simona, and anybody who was involved in organizing this entire thing. I know it's a huge effort to uh, put on events this size, so thank you for everything you've done to make this happen. Um, general shout out to anybody who's worked on public goods funding. It's uh, not easy to do this kind of work, but it's really important and crucial for what we're all building collectively. Uh, personally, I want to thank Open Grants, Moloch Dow, and Stateful Works projects like um, the Beacon Book and 1559 NFTs. Uh, these are really great projects to learn from as we're building these things, iterating on mechanisms over and over. Um, and then finally, over the last three months, uh, this project has grown to represent the contributions from 18 different teams, and you can see all of those teams there. It literally wouldn't exist without their feedback and continued membership. Um, so shout out to any of the core devs that are part of this. There's a couple in the room here, here, there. Um, give them a high five after. Thank them for their work. Um, and the, the, the other thing is, uh, this is still being built, so if you see something in the presentation which, uh, as a contributor or a sponsor, um, or a community member, and you're like, wow, I should be a part of that. I have this skill set I can contribute. Please reach out. There's way more to still build. Um, I'd really appreciate any help we can get. All right. So what the heck is the Protocol Guild? Um, I realize my title is a little general, but we're going to get into that now. So specifically, it's a contract which vests assets to a self-curated list of members. And then more broadly, it's a mechanism for voluntary sponsors to share value generated by applications directly with Ethereum protocol contributors. And protocol contributors here means um, core devs, client maintainers, researchers, people who are making tooling for builders, and the coordinators that operate between all of them. And we hope this will incentivize stability, growth, uh, reward for the long term of the contributor set to make it more robust. And by robust, we're thinking anti-fragile. Um, this is an attempt to get the core knowledge of Ethereum development into as many brains as possible. Why do we need a new mechanism? You know, there's tons of public goods funding mechanisms. Um, and why, in this case, do we need a new one? Um, so there are three main motivations related to incentivizing long-term, uh, sustainable long-term core, de core development. And um, those three are incentive imbalance, existing solutions aren't really suited for this, and the fact that protocol work is really complex. Um, and then in the next three slides, I'm gonna go through each of those along with how uh, those challenges influence the design of the mechanism. So the first one, uh, incentive imbalance. The first challenge is pretty apparent if you think about it for a second, but there's a pretty big financial incentive uh, which is skewed towards projects built on top of the protocol rather than the protocol itself. Um, as a credibly neutral, maximally uncapturable institution with no block reward, Ethereum can't really offer the same token incentives that applications or L2s can. However, it still needs to get new people in, new blood, new brains, new minds, and get them to love and uh, start continue building what Ethereum the protocol is. Um, and as the Ethereum ecosystem continues to grow, uh, the competition for talented individuals is only going to continue to increase. Uh, I want to be clear, this isn't to fault um, rationally minded individuals for weighting financial incentives or applications, protocols for leveraging the power of tokens. Uh, this is just kind of the reality of the context we're working in. Um, and then finally, also want to acknowledge that financial motivations aren't the only motivator for people. You know, there's a lot of different reasons people get involved with core development, and um, we just want to acknowledge that there are many other ones, but financial tools are just one in the tool set that we think is under leveraged. So to the design objective that we take from this challenge is that we should nudge the incentive balance back to the protocol by getting sponsors to send tokens to share value with the people who are actually building the protocol. The second challenge is that existing solutions are pretty limited um, in terms of what we want to do. So the first challenge, applications and layer twos want to sponsor, but curation is actually really hard. There's no existing solution which collects all protocol contributors into one mechanism, 
And if we were to expect a single organization to do this, uh, that's a pretty big ask to have them bootstrap it and then maintain the mechanism. Uh, and having it created outside of the contributor set w might even potentially reduce le the legitimacy of the mechanism. So the, the objective uh, in that second box on the right is we will self-curate the list for sponsors to just send uh, assets to a simple low-cost path for sponsors to regularly share value directly with protocol contributors. Um, going back to the other side, the second challenge is protocol contributors are also interested in this upside, but uh, self-organizing is hard. So uh, importantly, we want to account for the work of many contributors without making it too difficult to funnel this value to them. So again, the same design objective is to self-curate a list, um, give form to the existing relationships and, and contributions. And then finally, um, as I touched on in, in, the, in the title, the existing solutions uh, naturally favor teams. And I'll preface this part by saying anyone working on public goods is awesome and I'm really excited to see more uh, development around this area and uh, the experiments continue to blossom. Um, and we look forward to collaborating with the existing mechanism, mechanisms and the new ones which are gonna exist in the future. However, existing funding mechanisms are usually formed around their founding entities. Uh, this is Gitcoin grants, the Uniswap grants program, Optimism's retroactive public goods funding. Um, in these cases, curation naturally biases towards teams. For example, Prismatic Labs instead of Preston Van Loon, one of the developers who contributes to uh, Prismatic. It, and this happens because of the overhead associated with curation. You know, it's much easier to supply a single address versus 10 for a single client team. Um, so we don't want to depend on the organizations or the teams to have to take custody of funds that are sponsoring this mechanism because then they have to disperse to contributors on their own schedule uh, without individuals ever having visibility into the funds. And worst case, they may never see them. Um, I don't think that's happened yet, but you know, in the worst case, we want to make sure we're considering uh, all of these areas. So the design objective here is to, number three, avoid intermediation. Individuals should be the atomic unit, the smallest possible member in this set. And then finally, contributor continuity benefits the protocol. So contributions over time is a very good thing to have. Uh, the challenge is there's a really steep learning curve for protocol contributors to deliver value. It can take six to nine months sometimes for somebody to really understand a, a client code base to start to understand the research path for where the protocol is going and make meaningful contributions. And this is totally fine, it's just the reality, again, the reality of the context. So the design objective is that protocol contributors must be active for at least six months before being added to the set. Uh, second challenge is that contributor value grows over time, but there's less incentive for them to stay on once they're experts. You know, somebody works on a client team for four years, they've got a really deep knowledge of Ethereum, uh, and specifically the core protocol, but there may be other more lucrative opportunities. So the design objective is that we want to vest the assets over a certain amount of time, a year or four years, depending on what uh, we decide, to reduce churn in the contributor set, importantly, and to help transfer knowledge between cohorts. So those are the three challenges that we wanted to address, and these are the resulting characteristics or what we've settled on as kind of the best fit design for what we want to do. And so it's a single contract. Uh, we're looking to use the Astro Drop Shrine by Zephyr and Lewis. I don't know if he's in the crowd. Seems not, but shout out to him and, and the people that are contributing to that. One really nice thing about this um, approach is that new sponsors don't have to deploy a new vesting contract they can just send to an existing one. So the Protocol Guild could deploy uh, a contract, take on that gas cost, and then any sponsor can regularly send value to that contract. Uh, another nice thing is that the weights can be updated periodically. So uh, this is crucial for how we intend for this to operate is that like uh, a protocol contributor who started 10 years ago or, you know, 10 years ago is a bit optimistic at this point. We haven't been around 10 years, but um, we want to be able to reflect updates in the membership set over time and not have a fixed uh, immutable contract in this case. Uh, the other characteristic is that it vests assets from sponsors. Uh, these can be governance tokens, layer two sequencer fees, uh, recurring protocol fee revenue, fractionalized NFTs, ETH, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of stuff which this can accept and um, yeah. 
finally, uh, these last two, a weighted list and self-curated, I'll go a little bit deeper on the, on the next slide. So weighting and curation. One of the meta goals of the project is that we want to minimize governance and the amount of management that we have to do as much as possible. Um, we want to limit the breadth of activities that uh, contributors have to track or update. You know, all of these things takes time, so time away from what they would like to be doing, which is working on core development. So minimize governance as much as possible. And so the main uh, outcome here is that waiting, we want it to be as simple as possible. And currently, that's just the number of months you've been active, that's your weight in this uh, contract, this vesting contract. And then two and three relate to self-curation. Um, we think it's ideal to minimize intermediation between other external governance components. For example, uh, an external council. Um, we think that protocol contributors are best placed to evaluate who's meaningful, meaningfully contributing, so we should leverage that um, situational knowledge and that expertise to understand who's doing what at what time and, and how much. And then uh, finally, self-curation, we believe, is incentive compatible. Um, first, that adding new members dilutes existing ones, so you won't have non-eligible members being added to this contributor set. And then secondly, eligible contributors must be added to maintain the legitimacy of the set. So we think these two characteristics kind of balancing against each other is sufficient to you know, maintain the, the legitimacy of this over time. Um, but we'll see whether that holds in the wild. And then what do we actually get? A minimally mediated tool for recruitment, retention, and reward that allows protocol contributors to access some of the value creation that's happening uh, up the stack a bit on the application and protocol, you know, layer twos, they're creating a ton of value. Um, how do we get that back to the core protocol in a voluntary opt-in way? Uh, we get a financial incentive to help narrow the gap between the protocol and what's built on it, and a framework which is politically and operationally tailored to fit this use case. Okay, uh, what are we gonna do with it? We're hoping to run a pilot. Um, uh, it will vest for one year from deployment to make sure we're testing our assumptions. Uh, in the future, we'll probably vest it even longer for probably four years, which seems like an eternity in crypto, and it is, but the goal is, again, to vest the, these assets to keep people around and make sure that they're uh, spreading out the knowledge between different cohorts of, of core devs. Um, we're hoping to target 10 million in sponsorships just for this pilot. And then, uh, like I mentioned earlier, it will include periodic updates to members who are leaving and joining. And um, right now we have 70, 70 members who have joined as of today. So core devs, researchers, uh, client maintainers, um, and we expect to launch with about 90 members. There's a couple of people we're still waiting to, to join. Um, we're really excited to actually learn from this in the wild and not just have it be uh, in HackMD or uh, on slides and see if the mechanism is going to be useful, uh, we think it will be, how it can be abused, and then in turn, how it can be improved. Because we know for sure that there are things that we're missing and we want to improve them. Uh, one of the things that we go through in the docs is this long list of anticipated concerns. So maybe if you were listening to this presentation or you're watching it later and you're like, that's not going to work, um, that's totally fine. We've listed out a bunch of ways we think this can fail, and maybe one of these, I'll go through a couple of the most common reactions that uh, people have when they hear this. So is this a bribe? Uh, our opinion is no, but if it is, it's a really, really bad bribe. One, because it's completely public, um, and it vests whatever influence is purchased. You know, so if a really large whale wants to contribute two million to this thing, it, that's gonna vest over four years, and it goes to the entire contributor set, which means uh, you're not really buying any influence, and it's completely public. Um, uh, and with the current mechanism we plan to use, sponsors can't withdraw assets from the vest, so members really aren't obligated to continue working towards a sponsor's goals once they've sent assets to the contract. Um, and then it kind of goes without saying, but I'll mention it anyways, if a shadowy figure wanted to bribe somebody, uh, influence Ethereum governance, they can very easily do that today without this mechanism. They can just avoid it and send money to the individuals that they want to uh, corrupt. So they don't need this mechanism to do that. Uh, the second concern we hear a lot is that self-curation is gonna lead to gatekeeping or you know, uh, exclusion of certain areas of the ecosystem. Um, and that's definitely a valid concern. 
Um, and the way we're trying to counter that is by pushing early now before we launch for a really wide distribution. Uh, of the 100 people we've heard back from, only eight said they were too busy or not interested, and uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good uh, return, or it's a pretty good number that's actually interested in being part of this. Um, and then in subsequent cohorts, we'll probably expand this to other areas of the ecosystem, other teams. Uh, again, if the mechanism isn't viewed by the community, the sponsors, uh, as being legitimate or holding legitimacy, then there's no reason for them to continue sponsoring it, and they'll just not contribute to the next uh, contract. So it's really important for the members to maintain the legitimacy or the perceived legitimacy of this curated set. And then more broadly, how will this design fail? Um, yeah, we try to think about everything, including how this is just gonna like crash and burn. Uh, there are a lot of ways, but two of the main ones are believing that voluntary donations and the effort necessary to scale to the levels this mechanism needs to be effective, it's just not gonna work out. Like if you have one person going to every single sponsor, it won't scale. Um, so that's one concern. And the way we hope to kind of, we hope to build norms around contributing to this, uh, in the docs, we go through what it would look like if new protocols donated 0.5% of their tokens or 1%, you know, a couple different scenarios. Um, but an important part of that is building the norms around regularly contributing. And then the other kind of way that this could really fail is that uh, we're sort of assuming that developers even want to self-govern an asset stream like this, uh, including the responsibilities and pressures that come associated with it. So. Um, there's a bunch more concerns in the docs if you want to go through them um, and you find a new one that seems legit, we will happily add it to the documentation. Uh, and then as, I, as I'm wrapping up here, just some member quotes um, to give you an idea of what they think about this. Uh, the first one is, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, but without the parts, there is no whole. This project addresses the parts without diminishing the whole. And then Michael Spruill from Lighthouse. Uh, I don't think he's here, but if, if he watches this at some point, um, here's his quote. Thanks for contributing it. Uh, I love that the Protocol Guild centers individual contributors ahead of organizations, and in doing so, grants autonomy to all of the people working on Ethereum space layer. We have an opportunity to prove the viability of an alternative funding model for public goods, which I hope will inspire many more experiments in radical economic coordination. And that's it. Uh, again, just like this is um, one project of many that's working to support public goods. It's not the solution. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, this is, uh, it, it's more than just a single mechanism. It's a network of public goods projects, people that are building them. Um, and I've learned so much from uh, being involved with them personally and then, you know, just watching people over the years building public goods. So. Uh, just want to make sure to emphasize that this isn't being developed in a vacuum and in the future it will exist in a network of people and uh, projects which are similarly minded. So um, thanks for listening. Yeah, this, this QR code, it goes to the docs. Um, I would love for everybody to read it. And again, if you saw something here which you saw, if you saw something here which made you think I'd love to be a part of this or I have this skill set, um, even just if you're a member of the community and you want to learn more about it, please reach out.